Hopefully we're going to keep you awake for the next whatever, however long, 20 minutes. Let's say 20 minutes amongst friends, right? We've got a presentation. It's fairly interactive. So uh, I'm Nick Miles. I'm one of the people here from Census. I'm Celestine Yarn. I'm one of our senior managers. And we're going to talk a little bit about what an attacker sees. That's not you as an individual. It's you as an organization. Next screen, please. Wow. So, state of the internet. We all live on the internet, right? Whether you like it or not, you can't really get away from it. And the internet fundamentally has not changed that much in the fact organizations need to be secure. Before we didn't have the internet, we still need to be secure, right? Now we've got the internet, we need to be secure. However, the speed of the internet adoption is dramatic. We've all seen that, right? Whether that's individuals or whether that's organizations. And the real, the real beauty around, or the real risk around uh, keeping the internet secure is, is the sprawl around the internet. I'm fine, I go on the internet, I go to Facebook or whatever, right? Organizations have development teams, have marketing teams, have various other teams that just spin up things on the internet. Nobody really knows about it. Or certainly people who would need to secure it don't really know about it. So, and we've all seen this, right? And then obviously you look at what's going on in the world for the last couple of years, whether it's ransomware, whether it's attackers, you know, want to get 50p off everybody in the world or whatever that may be. Yeah, then we know all, all organizations are really concerned around the security of their internet estate. And we're going to talk about how we see that estate very slowly. Next. Right. So census does two things. We're going to talk a lot about both of those over the next 20 minutes or so. But one of the things we do is we scan the internet. And part of that, we produce the state of the internet report. You're all welcome to have a copy if you want it. And there's a QR code in a minute if you want to actually get it digitally. Some of that we have used to produce some really interesting stats. So this is where the interaction comes in. And misconfiguration and exposure and exposure represents something percentage-wise of the risks of vulnerabilities on the internet. Somebody shout this out. Do we have any guesses? Give us a guess. 80. 80. Any others? 90. Was that 45? 72. 72. 60. Keep in mind that the thing that gets all the news is the vulnerabilities, not the misconfigurations and exposures. Any other guesses before we give you an answer? 60. 60. Next. Right. Lewis. <laughs> 88%. 88% misconfigurations. That's humans. Somebody has to configure something. That's 88% of all misconfigurations. That's a, quite a big number, right? Pretty scary. Next, Lewis, right? Lewis, please, yes. Thanks, Lewis. So, again, interaction. Amazon, Microsoft, Google, and Oracle make up what percent of all hosts with services on the internet? I was shocked by this. 99. Any other guesses? Anyone want to go colder on their number? Yeah. I was shocked about it. And I said exactly the numbers you lads, just, you people have just said. 45, 45. Lewis, drum roll, nine percent. Yeah, the interesting thing about what you're seeing there, Amazon, Google Cloud, Azure, for example, those are all services that you interact with a lot, and it's the services that you feel a high impact when they're down. So if Azure's East Coast services went down, for example, their shard is down, we all feel that really rapidly. You kind of see it spread across the internet. Of, oh, I can't log into Cloudflare or whatever you know key application you might be using in your security day to day. However, it's actually not a lot of the internet. There's a lot of other stuff out there. When Celestine says East Coast, she does not mean where I live in the East Coast of the UK. US East Coast. Okay, I'm just saying. We don't have a data center in Scarborough. If we, if we did, it wouldn't be Microsoft's. <laughs> <laughs> Next, please, Lewis. What percentage of high and critical risks live in the cloud? One thing to think about, we just said 9% of those major cloud service providers are what's on the internet, but how many of the risks out there actually live in those cloud environments? 70? 90? 95? All right, you're pretty good. This is a pretty educated audience. Hey, Lewis, you want to give us the answer? 65%. So you've got 9% of the internet hosting 65% of the critical and high risks out there. Quite high, right? 
Next loose, please. Right then. Log 4J, we've all heard of that, right? <laughs> Is there any really, really gecky, techie geeks in here? Did you can't be, because we haven't let you out. Did anybody have a really bad weekend when that was announced? <laughs> anybody else? There we go, there we go. Anyone's weekend's ruined? So, what percentage of Log4j vulnerability, vulnerable assets still exposed online? 40? 40? 60? 50%? 50%? 70? You are all really skeptical, aren't you? <laughs> You're all cynics. Great. Lewis, please. 36%. So, we're not as bad as you lot think we are. <laughs> right? That chocolate mousse was obviously not that good. To get to this 36%, Lewis, I'll just have you click one more time. We timestamped assets online, assets exposed to the internet with uh, log4j vulnerable vulnerabilities across kind of the days leading up to the announcement, when the announcement happened, and then in the months following. So this is where we are today. The thing about log4j, a bit like misconfigurations and exposures, if you knew you had it in your environment, if you knew you were using a log4j API because it would be affected, you would have gone and fixed it, right? It's, Pretty simple, um, but it just so happens that there's still a lot out there, predominantly because we think people just don't know that it belongs to them. We have one more for you, Lewis. Hold on, we should go and live in Africa or Australia, by the way. Australia actually has done really well. If you track this, so we keep this uh, dashboard online. Um, if you were, uh, Lewis, find just going one more back real quick. Um, this was actually quite a bit higher when it first started out, so they actually did a quite good job in Australia to resolve this, and you can actually kind of timestamp through on our website if you ever are curious. It's easy though, they've got our politicians, four people and a kangaroo. <laughs> Please tell me there are no Australians in here. <laughs> I don't care. We just beat you at cricket. Oh. Anyway, Lewis. next Lewis, please. Thank you. Uh, how many servers globally are running a version of OpenSSL version 3.0.0 and above? Does anybody know why this matters? Yeah, I don't, by the way, so don't ask me. <laughs> no? Okay. Uh, two, three weeks ago, um, the OpenSSL group started to talk kind of in different chatter groups about the fact that they were going to be announcing two CVEs. Uh, Security Researcher was also involved in this. Now, we haven't seen that kind of chatter since Heartbleed back in 2014. Um, which is also part of the origin story of census. So the security community was pretty interested to see what was gonna go and happen with this. Um, and it was listed at the time before it was properly announced and all the details were released and the patch was released um, as probably a high risk. Does anybody have any guesses about how many servers in the world were gonna be impacted by this? 25%. 25 this is a kind of a, just a, a pure stat, not a percentage this time. Yeah. Thousands, how many? I'll give you guys a hint. There are over 1.79, 1.8 million servers in general that use OpenSSL, and this critical vulnerability affected a specific version and above. So of the 1.8, 1.7 million, any guesses about how many were affected by this one that was getting so much chatter? I would say about everything because many libraries and everything interconnects together. Lewis, please put us out of our misery. Only 7,000. For something that was getting as much chatter as Heartbleed was getting back in the day, it was only 7,000. And if you have any bonus points, does anyone want to guess how many were in the UK? All of it. All of it. Wow. <laughs> no, unfortunately, the US got the, uh, the distinguished Good. kind of top of the list. There was only 362, I believe, that were in the UK specifically. So for something that was getting a lot of chatter, it wasn't actually that big of a deal in the end. It was also downgraded from critical um, later on as, as more details were released. Lewis, please. Wow, dashboard, this is you, right? Yeah, this is the dashboard of what's going on. If you guys are ever curious, you can go to the census website. We track all of this in real time. All right, I think that ends the game. Uh, Lewis, if you wanna just give us one more click. Unfortunately, there is no prizes if you did guess right. There was a lot of great guesses out there. We will give you, you can have a notepad. <laughs> True. Come to the stand as a notepad. You take them or I have to carry them to Yorkshire. So come and get them. He will have to physically carry them. Yes. I'm strong, but I'm not that strong. All right, so we won't make you work for these stats. Just want to give you guys some context. That was how the internet is changing in terms of vulnerabilities and exposures and misconfigurations and how they're trending and what we see causing them. However, if you were to narrow down into what we would most likely care about beyond just the academics of that and what might be important in the future, um, this is about what the organization's attack surface looks like. So if you're an individual organization and you're security probe trying to protect your organization. 
A um, couple of specific things that might be interesting for us. 80% of security incidents this year involved an external cloud asset. Two thirds of organizations experienced an incident that started with an unknown asset just in general. Now those are really high stats and anytime I see super high stats like that, I get a question mark around, well why isn't anybody doing anything about it? Especially if the third stat is that that issue is growing. So when you talk about an attack surface in general, that could be the assets that are your IPs and hosts, that could be your subdomains, domains, software, end of life certificates, could be anything that your organization is spinning up online that's exposing you to vulnerabilities and misconfigurations. So that combination of facts is pretty important. The fact that it's so prevalent and that it's increasing rapidly should probably beggar the question, why isn't anybody doing, doing anything about it? There you and go. Lewis, that would be your cue. We've all heard the term attack surface before though, right? I'm not, yeah, good. It probably means 20 different things to all of us, right? But we'll go with the fact that you've all heard it before, which is great. Now, when I started doing IT security, I'll use the inverted commas, because back then it was just a piece of string. Uh, the landscape was pretty simple, right? This is back in, I left the military in 2001. So we'll say 2001, yeah. I think Windows 95 was just about there. I added, actually did an MCSE and NT4, and that was bleeding edge at the time. It's horrendously bad now, yeah. IBM, Checkpoint, and Oracle were kicking around. It was the days that nobody ever got fired for buying Oracle because everybody bought Oracle, right? And Lewis, if you don't mind, today, that's the landscape around cybersecurity as we speak. You can't see that, because I can't see it, right? <laughs> Actually, I'm a little bit blind. But we all, you all come to these events, we come to these events, right, we're, we're up there, and everybody talks to you about various different things. There's 60,000 vendors out there, all telling you to do something the same or different or whatever it may be. It's immensely confusing. What we look at as census is, we look at it from the outside in. Most of these vendors, and they're all very good products, I'm sure about that, right? I'm not here to, do, to slate the competition because they're not a competition. Most of these organizations will provide tools that allow you to look at the assets you know about. But as we've just seen, 69% of attacks came from assets that you don't know about. Our view is about telling you the assets you don't know about and the ones that you do but we're really interested in the ones that you don't know about, so you actually then do know about them. Lois, please. So what you should expect from an attack service management platform, if you're starting to look at this and you're starting to think, okay, this is a solution I wanna go see, there's a bunch of different new vendors out there, there's some established vendors that are acquiring new and smaller organizations in order to offer this as an add-on solution. There's a couple of baseline things that you want in your buyer's guide or your evaluation as you're looking at different tools, because we are all, in a lot of cases, talking with the same type of words. It's like saying zero trust, right? A lot of people are saying attack surfaces right now. So the first thing you want to know is what kind of data is the attack surface management platform that you're evaluating looking at? Are they doing continuous discovery? Thank you. Um, so for example, you want to know how often are they scanning the IPv4 and IPv6 space? At what breadth of ports are they looking at? in order to conclude what they do about the assets you don't know about, right? Because anybody can do scanning, but can they do it quickly and fast enough to get you enough information that also gives you a historical look back? The second thing you wanna know is how do they handle the management of those exposures? So OpenSSL, for example, the one we were just talking about, right? There was some chatter, you know, we knew about it was going to be announced, it was November 1st, I believe. Did the, surf, the solution that you're looking at, when something like that is coming out, did they immediately implement across all of their uh, customers' uh, use cases the actual tag or the, oops, question number two. <laughs> did they immediately do something about it, right? Um, so that might be, you might be looking for, is there a rapid response team? Is there a research group that you guys have within your organization that continues to evolve the product that I'm using? Um, how many exposures are you tracking or CVEs are you tracking and how do you grade them in terms of high or criticality? Are they following a framework or do they have something that's in-house that they've developed themselves? The third thing you wanna look at, which is really important because we went back to that stat about 80% in this year alone uh, related to an external uh, cloud asset, which is you wanna be looking at, do they, are they able to scan those four big providers or a number of providers? Do they also look at DigitalOcean, for example, where most organizations don't wanna see um, the official cloud environments being placed in? I'll give you an example just for the fun of it. Um, we had an organization that came to us recently and said, 
Okay. We spent $8 million extra last quarter alone in our AWS environment, and we're not sure why. We don't know what those cloud services were, and it was a Delta. This is an international manufacturing organization, which is a kind of organization that doesn't have the margins to pull that off, right? So we took a look, did some scanning, and we came back and gave them the cloud assets. They had some discussions internally, and they came back to us and said, so 80% of that eight million that we spent last quarter alone, more than we should have, was assets we spun up for single projects and one-time use, and we didn't spin back down. Now, security implications aside for something like that, now you're spending an enormous amount of money and resources that could be much better spent elsewhere. And you kind of see that if you went back to that first slide we were talking about where you've got 100 developers to one security person. Then you've got the security issues within that. So we talked to another uh, an Asian property conglomerate who thought we'd probably got 120 cloud assets online. And when we did the research for them or we just put out a quick scan, we came back with 600. Now those ones in particular did have misconfigurations. They had a publicly exposed uh, and configurable storage bucket with facial recognition photos of their customers, um, right? It's, it's the stuff you'd solve if you knew about, which is what you want to be looking for in a solution. Can it give you that kind of insight? And then the last thing is, how do you actually consume the information? How is the alerting uh, going to be set up? How does it integrate back into the solutions that you already have invested in? We saw that slide with a thousand different vendors out there. You can't get rid of all those vendors just to use an attack service management solution. It's not a good, good plan. Um, so Lewis, if you click one more time, this would be something like what Census would say about how you want to integrate. You want to integrate your ticketing systems. You may even want to integrate some of the old security solutions you invested in, like a Tenable or a Qualys that are going to do the inside-out scanning so you have the perfect combination of inside-out and outside-in. Lewis, please. And so, you'll be pleased in our last two slides. Then we're out. We're getting kicked off. So, Census, if you want to know for more information about us, you want an attack surface uh, report doing, we can do that for you. Please come and see us, and we'll put you on the list, and we'll get you an attack surface. It'll show you what we think you look like, knowing some very basic information about your organization. Yeah, uh, We are the one place to understand the internet. We provide two things, an attack surface management tool and data. Our data is used by a lot, thousands of organizations worldwide to search what other people look like on the internet. Yeah, and we'll go into that in more detail as you, as you need to. Lewis, last one. There you go. If you need any resources from us, any of the dashboards we showed you guys today, the stats, um, or if you guys are curious about how the internet is changing, we publish a report on this every year, and we are happy to chat with you anytime. We've got loads of notebooks. <laughs> no, no food, but we've got notebooks. All right, thank you all. You've all been right. a great audience. Thank you very much.